The human body is our first classroom. The human body is our last classroom. The human body is the classroom within which every experience of our experience of the journey of life is experienced. The human body is the foundation for the enigma of consciousness. The human body is the vehicle by which we are delivered into an experience of flow with the animating force. Interplay is an international movement exploring practices and methods of fun and play to access the depth and height of human experience using the gateway of the body. www.interplay.org We coined the phrase of body intellectuals. Uh, obviously, we're intellectuals. And when I taught at PSR, that was sometimes problematic for people who wanted to come from their very heady classes and just lay down on the floor of my classroom and say, can I be a body now? <laughs> you know, um, but I am, I mean, Phil and I are intellectuals and we think through the lens of our whole experience, which we would call the body. So even our thinking would be embodied, right? And how does that present? Um, so, Having, a, having an embodied way of talking and thinking. It has been our quest to try to find accessible language, non-theistic language, for anybody who might be interested in the proposition of how our lived experience could be more generative for us. And we found that through singing and dancing and storytelling and silence, these other big, big forms that we don't often use in discourse, these actually present separate you know, avenues of information that do not cross over. They, you can't get the same information from talking as you get from dancing, or from dancing as in singing. You can't. So by bringing them all together like the ancients did, then we have more data, we have more, you know, amazing information in our own lived experience. You bring that into a community body who's having that, so many things shift and change. There's so much more information and complexity, mm -hmm. but it is possible for people to notice. Uh, the, people tend to slow down, you know, and actually have their life experience and they enjoy it and they feel more connected mm. uh, because everything, I call it the motherboard, the mo everything is being brought online and including our relationships. And because yeah. trauma and war and uh, enslavement, there are many reasons why people do not want to enter the body. And you know, our great spiritual traditions say suffering is, the, is part of the package here. How are we going to suffer? So that's a big part of the journey. Well, and they're probably, I mean, it seems like in a lot of the religious traditions, there are various th things that are taught in order for us to get some control over our physicality. And that's not a bad thing. Um, there, there are some really good reasons to do that. Um, but I, I think we might also believe that we may have overdone that just a little bit. Or we're at the time where We've got that down. We don't need to practice that so much. We can move on to another way of being, which may, in fact, uh, give us some other information or, or, or insight or whatever it is. You know, and, and I think one of the things we would say that we, we believe is that um, if you do different things, you, it's possible to learn different things. So if you only do the things you always do, you'll only learn what you can learn from those things. You know, as soon as you do a different thing, then there's a possibility of learning something new out of that or having a different kind of experience. So our work is a lot about trying to expand the range, really reclaiming some of the things that we may have weeded out um, 
So, you know, it's really good when you're little to learn not to scream all the time when you're in public. Um, but it's also good to remember that we can scream. Um, and that there are times when that is probably a good thing to do. Absolutely. And if you're creating, if you're making something that's perceivable, then that's not only, <laughs> you know, the experience you're having, but it's the experience that somebody else is having too. You know, if I'm just sitting here thinking, you know, you may not get much. You may not get much. So um, part a, a lot of our work has to do with this interaction. It's not just me doing my thing. It's really me either doing my thing with a witness or I'm doing it in conversation with someone or somehow there are people I mean it's as simple as if I sing somebody else can hear it if I don't sing nobody else can hear it um, so there's immediately mm -hmm. a, a, a connection across uh, across space um, you know and this is not even to mention kind of all that we've learned about how the movement of one body affects other people and the whole body. So um, it's, it takes that out of that individual realm too into the more um, community realm or even larger. I hang out with a lot of mystics. Um, by that, I mean people who are feel like they are in contact with mystery. And a lot of them are in my community uh, because our work evokes this. So we grow this. Uh, we're growing a whole pasture, <laughs> you know, perfect <laughs> for southern Indiana. <laughs> um, and I, I am also grateful just to know how many people are s just hungry to have this um, and don't want to explain it every minute. So for some of us, uh, we just need some spaces. You know, just need some spaces. And you know, I think that our work is one of those. So. I'm trying to, get the, uh, trying to see what I can do about you know, tiptoeing back into my own religious community and where there's, I think, willingness. And I've been very wounded in my practice of trying to figure out how to do this. Um, I've gotten hurt. So, but I, as I tiptoe back in, I, I, I wonder how in a beautiful group of people who I think are much more ready to move their whole beings than our tradition would, you know, th this template of, you know, white European-based history, you know, I, like how, you know, it's like such a, such a yearning. And every now and then, like a couple weeks ago, I just saw this explosion of people get up and dance in the middle of a congregational worship space to dancing in the moonlight at the invitation of the minister. So, oh, maybe it is the person who's leading who has to have the courage and the people who have had have to cultivate this so that this breaking through you know maybe people are tired of dismantling you know maybe they're ready to mantle you know um, I'm hoping that's where we're going you know I, I feel um, so grateful for my own special chemistry set <laughs> <laughs> that I've been given that seem to be awake to something greater from the beginning. Um, so I, I, I feel like I want to be careful not to make assumptions about how we get there or what that is um, for any individual person. Mm -hmm. I want to really respect all of the teachings that would say stop and look uh, for this right where you are without going to any grand thing. Um, for me, I'm lucky. I feel like by entering into the moment with whatever it is, I, I feel it inside my body, this awakeness. Um, I don't know if I can invite that for every person for some people, it's really as simple as inviting them to put one hand in the air, move your hand slow and smooth. And we're going to do uh, this little hand dance that I lead them into for a moment on behalf of you know, a loved one who's suffering. 
and their eyes are tearing up. For 40 years, they've been working around the struggle of this loved one, and they've never had a chance to do that. And their eyes are tearing up because something else is being tapped. To me, that opening is where the sensations can connect somehow all the way through the body, you know, through movement, through emotion, through the movement of thought, everything moving. That, if I can just allow that space for movements to happen, I feel like that's, and for some kind of blessing, you know, in that. Uh, I feel that's a, <laughs> kind of a victory, you know, <laughs> for me. I Awe is the first, is the word that comes up uh, for me, just experiential. So first of all, we would probably take it back to the experiential. What is that, what is the experience that we might be either pointing people toward or noticing when it happens? Um, and I think, you know, as human beings, just functionally, we seem to have this capability of having these moments. Uh, it doesn't seem to be happening all the time, but we just have these moments where we connect, we kind of recognize the bigger picture, we recognize connections of all things, we recognize our common humanity, we recognize, oh, you're pretty much like me, even though I thought we were really different sorts of people, or, you know, whatever that is. Um, and it's, it's more like, okay, what we, it's not so much that we said, okay, we want to have people have an experience of awe. How do we get there? It was more like we found that when we did those things, that that often was a result um, on big levels and li little levels. So it could be that, you know, we're in the first round of these simple, what we, we call babbling. We're doing the, the very first round and something happens, you know, between the two of us that was unexpected or had a sense of being profound or whatever, um, and then to recognize, oh, that's a powerful experience. That's, a, that's something that we think that human beings seek, and that when they have it, they're healthier. You know, we're, we're all better off, not even just as individual bodies, but uh, the group body and the bigger body. So w I, w I would probably take it back to that m kind of more experiential, mm -hmm. Um, what, what is the sort of experience? And of course, it would, be, it would probably be slightly different for different people, both what creates it and how they actually experience. But again, we, we have this kind of basic idea of what, what is it when we experience something that's bigger than us, um, when we sense our connection, and then what's possible when we recognize that? It seems to me that a whole different thing is possible you know, when we recognize our humanity. And if I can experience it in this group, well, maybe this group over here that I don't think it's possible to have it with, well, maybe it would be possible. So even just the imagination mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. being able to experience that connection, even though I haven't had it with that group over there, um, that must do something good for the world. You know. We really have to sneak up on mystery. Like if we try to use our part, mm, you know, it's like people say, mm, uh, <laughs> don't, you know, so we, and we have to sneak up on, on ourselves. So we use something called easy focus. It's one of our first tools. And, and you know, being able to not over focus, overlook, uh, overwork. That's really powerful. And so if we wanted to invite people to breathe or to do anything, the first thing we would do is release them from any obligation, right? And so that's the attitude that we bring. Obligation tends to immediately communicate as, what am I supposed to do? How am I, I mean, people move directly towards their judge, their questions of comparison. So the more I can send the message and believe the message myself that it doesn't really matter, <laughs> you know. Um, let's take a deep breath and let it out with a sigh because it probably feel good. Let's try it. <laughs> ah, you know, it, that kind of a, an approach is more fun. That's on our, that was on our list of things to do as we created <laughs> in, this, in, in this work together. Yeah. It's on our list. Um, maybe the most important thing.
Um, is it fun? So that, because if it's fun, then we know we're in the realm of where, what the body wants. The body wants to have fun. It does not want to be interrogated. It's the simplest thing to ask people to do. <laughs> you know, if you're going to ask, if you invite people into their physicality, actually breathing, and then the thing that we always add to it is this kind of audible sigh, so it's not just, it's really, <sighs> um, and even bigger. So the, the vibration in the body that happens when you sigh audibly actually even intensifies the experience of what it means to breathe. But it also makes it obvious. Do you know? And everyone can do that. So even, you know, the folks who are sitting in their chairs and they're not going to move very far, they are still breathing and you can probably make them breathe a little bit bigger and you can probably make them make that sound, although the first couple of times it'll be, it'll be quiet, it'll be polite. Um, but that's, you know, it's just an easy thing to ask people to do. And if there's probably one thing that Cynthia and I are going to be remembered for, it's going to be <laughs> that we made people breathe and sigh out loud. So, and shake. Yeah, and shake things out. So. And it just has such a profound effect, a profound and immediate effect on us to even do that. So we don't even, you know, there's, a, there's something about our work where <clears throat> there's a kind of irreverence or a kind of, we, we want to play this side of seriousness, partly because we are so serious and we know we need that other part, but also so it's not like such a big deal. Um, so even though, you know, it's like in some traditions, which I don't discount, of course, but um, in some traditions, you know, that's a very serious process. We're going to breathe. We're going to be conscious of our breathing, and, you know, and, and we're going to sit very still and we're going to pay very close attention. And it's kind of like that, you know. Um, and we just, we kind of do it almost as a throw off. Yeah, for me, limits, understanding limits. The f good fortune I had as a person trained in a dance studio was that, first of all, I had to recognize what my capacities and limits were for my body. Um, I'm, it turns out I'm not a great ball ballet dancer because my hip sockets are too deep and my legs don't literally turn out. They turn in. And while that is a kind of, you can think, okay, well that's, okay, she can't be a ballet dancer, what's that good, what's that good for, you know? Um, it also, though, extends to what happens when you fall down. How do you fall down? What are the limits of falling down? And to know that in a body, like as children, we rehearse all of that information, but to hold on to that rehearsal as with conscious contact, to fall, to be able to fall, to know that I am falling, to know that what it is to be fallen, to know what it is to transgress, to push somebody over, to know that when that's an accident and when it's intentional, to know these things on the root level, on the physical level, is where the, where the actual reality is. It's what people call reality. You know, I just, <laughs> I don't know. You know, it's like, that, isn't that something we should be in? I don't know. You know, um, I think so. So to get back to the body, close to the body, you get close to the thing that people call, talk about when they talk about the now. When they talk about be present. You know, when it's how do you deal with discomfort? You know, that these are all physical. So, you know, the, I think that limits um, and capacities, like my dad ran 100 miles often as a, a runner, um, a pioneer in the cross-country running thing, and he, he just blew my mind in, a, as an 80-year-old that he was doing that. So what's, what are we c capable of, too? We can see it in the Olympics. People are, we're always capable of something greater. And so that p interplay of limits and possibilities and the ex exploration of that, what is it to, for me to be a human? I, I have no idea. I'm still trying to figure it out. And now that I'm 63, you know, uh, in a ballet class where I can't turn out, um, what am I capable of? Why do I love ballet more now? Or why do I, why am I so, um, so having, even, I mean, so much more grief 
so much more friction in in my lived experience as I, I test my capacities out around the harm that's been done and how to lend myself to a better way. You know, that's painful, it's hard, and it's limits, the limits of my physicality and the need to depend on others and, and a whole circle of people working together and then a, the whole creation. I, you know, I feel that so deeply. Really, the, the thing that we've had to kind of work with the most is the idea of play. Um, and, and, you know, in our culture, that word is used pretty uh, lightly and loosely, and sometimes it's, again, it's kind of it, within a dismissive sort of way. Play is something children do, and, you know, we're supposed to be serious and grown up and mature and all of that stuff. Um, and really, what we were discovering was that play was all of those things lighthearted and frivolous and fun and all of those things and it's also got a lot of depth mm. to it and sometimes it's very serious you know we used to say you know we figured figured out if there was a period a, a point where tears and laughter were happening at the same time that's where god was you know so it's like that th those those things are deeply met um, and so we have this really broad idea of what play is and i think we also have a broad idea of, of what fun is, but I at the very at the very basic, it's a pleasurable physical experience, um, and you know it's not it's it's not always in community. You can have fun on, on your own, um, but there is often a community element to it. So, like that, I think one of the other things that we learned was that if you can get people to laugh together, that's the best way to create a group connection without having to touch. Um, like if you can get people in physical contact with each other, that's a, also a good way to create a sense of groupness. But if you can get them to laugh together, they'll have that same experience, you know, without necessarily having physical contact. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it may be one of those things that's just so elemental um, that you recognize, oh, if I'm, de if I'm describing something as fun, okay, that's enough. Um, and it may be, it turns out, I mean, this is, we, would be true of any experience that, you can describe it, you can give a name to an experience you might be having. Um, and I don't know exactly what experience you're having, but I might see recognition. I might have kind of a recognition of some sort of overlap, even though I'm not sure exactly what it is that you're experiencing. But that seems to be one of those basic ones where someone says, that's fine. You can say, oh, yes, I know. I know what that means. <laughs> and I like it, too. Um, and we're obviously, we're attracting people who want to have that kind of approach. So obviously there are other people who are attracted to, you know, the deeply serious and whatever approach and people who come to it's work with us are... It's a little wilder. You know, fun is a little wilder. And so we... And it's a, therefore also a little more mysterious. I think we tend to discount anything, you know, separate ourselves a little bit from anything that m maybe maybe put us on edge a little bit, you know. So there's a good reason for that. I, I do not trust a lot of people just willy-nilly. Um, I want to know that I'm going to be safe enough when I enter a space. So to have fun or to play, which means I'm not going to ha know what the outcome is and how to do that socially, you know, plays well with others. How am I going to do that? Um, I want to have my curiosity invited. I want to know that my mind is going to be involved. I want to know that I can take care of myself. I want to know that this is a permission-based space. It's not a controlled space. Somebody isn't going to tell me uh, how I'm supposed to behave. I mean, there's some requirements. And in interplay and our practice and teaching and leading life in general, we try to exemplify that more than tell, say those things out loud. Yeah. But those are underlying. We know that we create safe enough spaces through having that in our bodies. And yeah. we teach other people to have that in their bodies too. We encourage it, you know, that we, we're playing, um, but we're going to take steps. We're going to make this incremental. We're going we're gonna to go together. Um, we're going to find out and learn what's here together. Uh, we don't know what's here, right? But we have ways of, of, of of going through a process 
um, these little art forms and practices. And sure enough, over and over again, people feel like, oh, this is cool. I love this. And eventually they wind up, many of them wind up saying, why do I ever want to do it another way? <laughs> so play becomes, again, a blessed, beloved situation rather than a don't, you know, don't mess with me because you're telling me to play play. So which I think, you know, a lot of play spaces aren't play spaces.
even when we started the work that we're doing, you know, Cynthia and I have been collaborating for 30, mm, almost 39 years now. Um, and even the, the, the more recent part about uh, Interplay, which is more like 20, 28, 29 years. Um, oh gosh, that sounds so long. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I've been pretty lucky at, at actually figuring those things out and, and paying attention either quite consciously or sort of consciously to what I was supposed to do um, and what was going to be best for me and where my gifts lined up with, you know, the need in the world, what I perceived, what I might have perceived that to be. Um, so that's the main thing I think that there's, I've managed to find a kind of um, st stasis, stasis isn't a very good word because I feel like everything's constantly moving, but this kind of balance between what it is that I'm particularly good at and I feel called to do and the gifts that I seem to be have given and, you know, all the other parts of me that might make it possible for me, for example, to sustain working on a movement for 30 years, you know, even that, or to have a, a collaborative relationship that lasts almost 40. Um, I mean, some of that I just, I just chalk up to, you know, genetics um, or upbringing. So one of the words I use a lot to talk about um, what I feel like I, one of the things I try to, that I have tended out to live, tended to live out in my life is to be steadfast, which I think goes back to my upbringing. And you know, there are a bunch of steadfast people in my life, so it doesn't surprise me that I might be one too. Uh, so it could be something as simple as, okay, I'm willing to plod. I, kn <laughs> I know the value of plodding, um, and I often say I've not really had any big ideas, but I've had a lot of small ideas that have added up to big ideas. <laughs> um, and so I'd somehow I've kind of had, I, I had either knew that or was willing to follow the path that was leading in that direction. So that's really what sustains me is that it's in line. Um, the things that I might be doing and um, that I'm capable of doing or good at doing and the things that I enjoy that feed me. Um, that's what makes it possible just to keep going on and on. And you know, as an artist, as a creator, uh, to use that, to use that frame, that understanding is is a helpful, uh, a helpful frame too when you're thinking about uh, organizational life. Like one of the things that I do is I'm, I'm really interested in how organizations work, um, and have had a, a number of opportunities to kind of have have that play out to be able to use and kind of mess with institutions and organizations so that they can work well. Um, so I'm just interested in how, um, how, that, how that process works. Um, and, and as an artist, I can see that organizational project, uh, process as a giant art project. So let's say this work that we've done over the last um, 30 some years, you know, I just think of it as a, as, as a, as a really big art project, which means I'm willing to do the little, the little things that will keep the project going. You know, if you're an artist, whatever your form is, you have to do all these nitpicky little things. You know, you have to clean the brushes and you know, whatever the thing is that you do. You have to put in the hours. You have to do the little steps. You have to, you know, even the th parts of it that you don't particularly like in order to get the result you want. Um, and so it's helpful for me to have that frame of, you know, this is just like a giant art project. I often talk about the, you know, things that, the ac there, there's, there are accidents and there's providence. Um, and I'm definitely a believer in providence, but I also understand that that's, that's a belief. You know, that thing that happened, was that an accident or was that providence? Um, but to have um, a collaborative relationship, I mean, that's kind of amazing, I think, for two people who, are, especially two people who aren't married, uh, who aren't partners, uh, to have worked together for so long and so, so closely and so intimately. Um, so I've been really lucky uh, over time, um, in particular in this relationship with Cynthia, but in, with other collaborators as well. Well, I just was just leading a little group, and my truest service, I believe, is if, like St. Teresa of Lisieux, if I could be really the little flower that I am. Um, it's very hard for me to believe that in my culture to be a flower in a garden.
I mean, I'm a human being. What is my service? You know? Um, so, like, on, a, on, a, on the most primitive spiritual level, that, you know, I would like to be that. That, that is what I hope to be. But as a, you know, as a creator, as a maker, the, to, to be an artist uh, is such a prophetic, um, blessedly challenging, beautiful, gifted uh, service. Oh, I'm so lucky. I just count my blessings every day that I'm an artist. And that Phil and I have figured out how to hold ourselves, you know, financially uh, stable enough that we can, you know, remain artists. Because <laughs> I think that's very hard. Um, that, but that, to be an artist, to be of service as an artist is, and not to have to tie finances to the, to the, to the flow, but to the, you know, the productive elements, the technology itself. You know, that's, uh, that is a service. Like, this will far outlive us, um, as so my friends tell me. Um, and I believe them, uh, especially when people of color tell me that. This will outlive you, and we, your, our children will benefit from this. I don't know how many of them. There be, you know, could be five <laughs> or could be 5,000, but um, that's a service if people are more uh, loving, gracious, kind, full, uh, healthy, and not necessarily bigger and better <laughs> like I'm trying to be. <laughs> yeah. My dad was a lover, you know, an expressive, crazy engineer. And, you know, he hugged me in such fullness. And so did my, you know, my mom. You know, I, I'm so lucky. <sighs> so the, that parental love, um, I found very foundational. I know that both Phil and I have had that. We're very lucky. Because I know how that's not that doesn't come to everybody, um, but then with also within that, I was anointed by an energy beyond from beyond, and that energy was unconditional and it was neutral. It wasn't some mushy gushy love. It was bizarre. It was like it lit me up in a way. It gave me a point of contact for a love that like no other. And for 30 seconds, like an earthquake, I felt that love as unconditional. And that I was like looking from that point of view at everything unconditionally. I felt it in my body, what that love feels like, you know, from my experience. And it's unconditional and it's <coughs> neutral. And what did that do? It evoked my love. It evoked a torrent of endless desire to respond to that. And, you know, that little moment is what woke up this, well, what can I do? How can I serve? And, and that's what woke up the idea of trying to hold down some religion together, which was my question. You know, how can I you know, take who I am? And that seemed to be what came up in that moment. Um, but whatever it is, I, you know, even if that, I mean, that's like one of the questions I'm at constantly. It's not just dance religion, it's body and soul, and it's like creating and, you know, the, what do these art, human arts do? And like, I just come at that every day with, now I don't even think about it, but it's probably that same response to that moment. Like, it's endless. I, I can't. Or I'm just irrepressible, <laughs> 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 which someone has said about me. But I, I feel like that is, um, I feel like Phil and I do share a kind of a template, a beat on a kind, this whatever this love is that doesn't require anything back. I personally do, but that love doesn't. You know, and I think somehow we found each other. So, and there's a, like, it's so efficient uh, when we are generally working well together. We don't ask a lot. We don't, 
we're, we don't have to because there's a fire that isn't, you know, that's very cool and it's pretty constant. Um, and, and also get, we have a lot of separation from each other as well. It doesn't require us to be inside of each other's everything. As, a, as, a, as an artist, I feel like too, I'm not, even, I'm not even required to keep doing anything the same. I'm not required to do anything. I can, I have a shrine workshop, you know, I go off and do all sorts of art things. Uh, I'm not required by this to do anything. So that kind of freedom, wow. If, it, if I, you know, maybe, maybe my life work is just to see if I could get anywhere in the neighborhood of igniting that for another person as a human being. You know, if I could just pass any of that on, that would be, you know, successful. And I, I know I have been in the neighborhood, you know. So that's a, it's a transmission, you know. <laughs> Maybe that's what a good, you know, good teacher can do, is hopefully transmit some, some of the good that they're getting, and they've been lucky to get. If you go back to body and soul times, all of us, Judith and Cynthia and I, were all kind of looking at this question of physicality and spirituality um, because we knew we had all been attracted to dance in one way or another and we knew what happened to us as we moved and then what happened to us as we used dance and choreography as a means of exploring various ideas um, and then also having to deal with the challenge of uh, physicality in most Christian tradition where there's quite a split between body and spirit and so that's what we were trying to kind of bring back together and to find some language to talk about that to teach people and so when we were working we were often doing a combination of performance and workshops and maybe dancing and worship or whatever um, so that the process of articulation was really important to us uh, we would I think our concerts were almost more like lecture demonstrations and they were kind of straight concerts although one of the things we were also trying to hold was that we wanted the choreography to work in dance situations as well that we could perform in dance uh, in dance theaters, theaters yeah. um, and do kind of straightforward dance performances that and that the choreography would stand up um, in those settings whether you had that kind of spiritual background or, or not. Um, so that was really, you know, it was that inter integrating process that was there from the very beginning um, in terms of what we were exploring and what we were trying to convince people of um, and also how that, you know, just what we kno knew of our own experience of kind of exploring these the bigger questions about life and meaning and whatever and that uh, the arts and dance in particular could be really interesting avenues for that. Yeah, my dad was, uh, his people had lived in Indiana for some time and were, my grandfather worked at the Delco electronics plant outside of Kokomo, that's where I was born. Um, I was, you know, in the wee stages when <coughs> my dad was at Purdue University coming kind of crawling out with through intellect and some recognition a sort of a staunch young Methodist character and a cross-country runner he found my mom when he was in the Navy and moved her back there baby me and up you know through the through this beginning in Indiana but a feeling of never really losing connection I don't know I don't understand that's mysterious I think place the meaning of place even if you lose leave or I think my dad was escaping <laughs> um, my dad escaped and took us to Los Angeles I grew up there in the southern uh, the South Bay of Los Angeles wound up in high school having a United Methodist for a public school dance teacher my grandparents were northern Indiana folks and so the first 18 years of my life um, was living in in southern Indiana and, and while I was at Indiana University I had been studying um, textual artwork uh, with a guy named Bud Stalnecker and 
um, I had continued to do textile artwork after I finished at IU. Um, and as I was discerning what to do in terms of graduate school, I took my work to him. He was actually in Indianapolis having back surgery. And I took, and I had this garbage bag full of my artwork. I took it to the hospital. <laughs> I can remember he had a pair of duck slippers. He was kind of a character. Um, and he looked at the stuff and he said, well, you know, if there's one thing that you should do, you should go to Berkeley and study with Ed Rossback, who was a textile artist, quite well-known textile artist uh, at the time, who was at UC Berkeley. And my journey as an artist um, was kind of a, uh, a certain mixture of obliviousness in that, you know, not having, not having kind of all the, uh, various markers to understand for, for people to kind of recognize and say, or for me to recognize and say, oh, you're an artist. Uh, that took a long time for me to figure out. But I did make that, got to that fork in the road, chose the art path, and um, kind of never looked back. All these other things happened when I went to Berkeley that I couldn't have anticipated. Uh, so it was, you know, that part of it, the, that's kind of more mysterious part, you know, how you end up someplace yeah. that turns out to be the right place. Yeah. Uh, we were both part of a dance company called Body and Soul Dance Company. And this was a group that was started by um, a woman named Judith Rock. Uh, and I had come into contact with her through a performance she actually did at my church uh, in Berkeley, a church that I joined when I moved to California. Um, and <clears throat> Judith was often choreographing pieces with lots of people in them. And at one point, not too long after I met her, she invited me to dance in, in one of these pieces. And then I sort of became part of this collective of people. They kind of treated themselves as a collective. This was the 70s. Um, great time for collectives. Glad we got that out of our system. Um, <laughs> But we you know, kind of became part of that community. Um, and then not too long after that, um, she remounted the piece with a slightly different group of people. And I think that's when Cynthia first came in, into the group. Um, and at that point, there, partly because Judith often created pieces with more people in them, there were, were there a number of people around. Um, but Cynthia had left for a bit to do an, an internship uh, in Washington State. And during the time that she was gone, uh, Judith and I and another, another colleague kind of decided to shrink the company down to three people so that we could travel easily. And about the time we were making that decision, Cynthia came back. And we realized that she was supposed to be the third person. So it was Judith and Cynthia and I. And so for then the next you know, six or seven or eight years, um, the three of us danced together. So that's where we first met each other. And there was this really lively, um, kind of art, art and theology crowd in Berkeley that, was, that revolved around the seminaries out there, in particular um, Pacific School of Religion, which was part of the Graduate Theological Union. This little company that we had for a while uh, was really where we first uh, worked together. Um, and then Judith moved to New York um, with her husband when her, her husband took a job there. And we all kind of, Cynthia and I went our separate ways for a little bit, but then came back together and decided to pick up some of the threads that are continue on some of the threads that we're developing in that company, but also to take it off into a slightly different and slightly broader uh, direction. And that's when we really started uh, Interplay. You know, I can't say enough for the importance of the whatever was happening at that time in the 70s and probably the 60s to the 70s when there was beginning to be the shift between an art, an art moment that was about form and it was shifting back to narrative and shifting back towards meaning. I was coming across all the arts. We were kind of both trained in the art for art's sake part but our predecessors before that, people were really using, shifting the nature of the body, shifting the nature of dancing uh, out of the ballet and kind of a, sort of a hierarchical point of view to a more uh, organic approach, even though I'm not sure Martha Graham was very organic um, sometimes. But this deep, uh, these deep waves and following in the minute, the 70s, the, the, meaning, the meaning of story 
narrative. Uh, who are we? And when I was in seminary at Pacific School of Religion, my professor Robert McAfee Brown was very interested in story and narrative. And so, was the, so the preaching movement began to have that, those colors. And the folks in the Sacred Dance Guild movement had been rising up for some years, and the leaders in that had formed a very cohesive community of mostly women, not, com not exclusively, but Phil and I were fortunate to be considered teachers in that place. Anywhere where we've been able to teach, we've been able to, I think, cultivate not only how does, how does body, body wisdom, how does spiritual intelligence you know, work on this level, <laughs> on this level of the basement, um, right where we are, um, how do we get it to shine? How do we get it to, to emanate? Um, how do we find freedom uh, together? How do we tap the love thing in the most direct way? How do we, how do we get beyond difference and, mm. and, and, and appreciate it? So those kinds of questions were, we saw that improvisation which I would call the ability, you know, it's a craft that teaches you how to do the not foreseen, but it's based in everything that you know, and it's like jazz based in forms. Improvisation, we both have a kind of magical gift, and I would call it magical, you know, that when we improvise together as dancers, it just showed up. And then Phil, I think, was particularly gifted at improvising with story, and these desires, like what can our bodies do they built this, like practicing and playing and then growing into a company that we call Wing It Performance Ensemble, who are all professional artists who are similarly it, delighted by crafting for an audience. Um, so not just the experience or the process, but the, but the presentation. Can we make something that's worth seeing? And so our questions have been also under that discipline not just experience and how do we feel, but how does the, you know, how does communication happen? What are we in service to? Hmm. Um, what, and the disciplines of that. So, and that's, tho those learnings in Wing It are what, ha what then compelled us to keep, well, to, to find a network of people, growing network that, of people that were curious about similar things. I think these are people we now call seekers, you know, people who are asking questions and wanting a lived experience, which, which we now call spirituality, a lived experience of connection, of creative life, of inquiry. We need creative practices that really allow a diversity of voices and bodies. And while the two of us are representative here of, a, of white people, um, the future of what we're practicing is our investment is in complexity. So both gender uh, fullness and also uh, cultural fullness and uh, also mental health diversity. So we're not fixating on people becoming better, you know, <laughs> uh, mentally, you know, that some of us are, are, will be living in different stages of mental health at any given time, or physical health, uh, in terms of our bodies, and that, so generation, all of that, that creative practice and this kind of practice, I know wants to be, the earth, the body itself, wants it to have complexity, and wants to be expressed as such, so in the future, uh, uh, that is what will rise out of this practice. I know because that's what we're working on. Some, sometimes I use um, Star Trek The Next Generation as, a, as kind of an example of how in that, in that particular show there were, you know, these whatever, eight or nine characters, the main characters, and each of them did a kind of slightly different thing. Um, and that really the magic of the, of the crew was that everyone brought their particular gifts to bear. So there was the empath, but it was like everyone didn't need to be an empath. Right. Um, and there was the warrior, not everyone needed to be the warrior. There was the engineer, not everyone needed to be the engineer. And I think one of the things that, you know, even after 30 years, I'm not really sure if, my guess is that actually we've attracted people to our work who have a particular set of interests and skills. And it's really helpful 
in community to have at least some people who have those skills and that they're transferable into the community they can affect the entire community in the same way there are a bunch of other people with uh, with important skills that, that that bring that can be brought to bear for the whole community, that that and it's kind of it kind of mixes in with the diversity idea that you really the power of um, community is that you can have a bunch of different people who bring different things to the table and that the combined body wisdom is going to be better than any of our individual body wisdom. I mean this has been true in my collaboration with Cynthia that we just we just know that if she's got an idea and I've got a slightly different idea that if we keep wrangling until we find a place that's somewhere in between that's not a diminishment of either point of view but the best kind of integration and that's going to be better and that if there are even more bodies involved in that that is that is going to be better and that's the way our work has evolved is um, as a lot of people have had an influence on it yes. um, that it's con and that continues to grow and change so but I think two things, both the importance of different gifts and different skills, recognizing that that's true, that we don't all have to be the same, um, but there are, but all of these gifts are important. We can't, we shouldn't discount them. Um, and also that um, we're really, the combined body wisdom is gonna be more powerful than any of the ideas we have as individuals and that we should figure out some ways to work on that. Yeah. So. The other thing that I'm thinking about a lot and trying and beginning to give language to is spiritual intelligence as the cumulative intelligence of all of the intelligences. Uh, Phil and I were talking about this on the plane and how really when we say body wisdom, we're talking about spiritual intelligence. We're talking about mind, body, heart, spirit. Now, spirit is, is just as this animating, connective force, uh, so the most ground level way of thinking and talking about this. Spiritual intelligence having the whole body, spirit, body intellect lit up at, at whatever level it is there. Um, I really think that naming that, having a way to language that without being in a religious or even spiritual conversation like, oh, spirituality, like what are the practices, you know, spirituality, but really understanding this, you know, fullness as important. I w I'm going to say sacred, you know, to the level of, you, you use the word ultimate meaning, um, that it has, it's crucial now. It's crucial now and for the future. It's probably been cru crucial. But with our planetary issues, our growing population, our struggles now, when we're up against each other like this, we can't find space. Now we have to, we have to find and apply this. And so spiritual intelligence, or you know, what I, in my own life, will call ensoulment, the feeling of that deepest self really coming fully into you know, the flower. Uh, that's one of the things I'm, I'm hoping to talk about and think a lot about with other people in the future. Uh, it's starting to be named spiritual intelligence by some people in, the, in that level of work, but I, I don't know if, it's, if we're recognizing it quite yet. Um, because we're in this period of time where it's so, where anger is, seems to be, there's just this current of anger and fear that seems to be running through our, um, through our culture and our communities and the world for that matter. Um, and to, <clears throat> the response to that in my opinion, the only way to respond to that is with an attitude of love. And I, I think of that as not just kind of, it's got that, the emotional part of it too, but as a practice, love as a practice. What, if I'm gonna make choices about what I'm doing, am I gonna take the, 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 the the path of whatever the opposite of that is resistance or um, not the resistance isn't part of it, but you know, am I gonna get all up in myself um, and probably respond to anger back with anger or some other kind of stronger physical force. Um, and so 
and I, you know, I did, there are there are a few people in my life right now who who are just saying that kind of over and over again. We have our friend Shoinka who she's just made that the center of of what she um, is kind of promoting in the world. Um, and her circumstances are much different than mine. Uh, so to be able to um, to hear that message from her gives a particular kind of power. Um, but it just seems to me that, that at this point in time, that that's the that's what I want to put at the center of how I'm making my decisions. And it was kind of funny. I was doing this little thing with, um, I teach interplay in Australia. I've been going there for a number of years. And I was doing a little bit of work with a guy who's in Australia. And he was leading me through a process that he uses as a business consultant with, um, with folks. And long story short, at the end of the process, we were kind of narrowing down kind of what was at the center, what I saw as the center of interplay. And there was love. You know, right in the middle, and I'm not, and I'm, I do not, and Cynthia can attest to this. I do not kind of live out of my emotions. Um, if, like, if I, I, as I often say, if I believed in ch chakras, which I don't really, but you know, I work up in my life. I look work up pretty high, and so it's not. But there's that word, you know, right at the center of what I think we're doing, which I think is, is really, really the thing. So, mm. you know, it's not just. Um, motivator it's a it's a force you know that I think is really at in the middle of um, how I want to make choices in the world in a broad way and I think it's right at the center of how we work in interplay that our job is to is to love up people <laughs> and to give, give them ways to love up each other that's mm -hmm. probably the stronger thing that we do is we give them opportunities to love each other um, to take care of each other rather than us taking care of them. So. Mm -hmm. Really, actually, we start by naming the good that we see. So it's, um, you know, in, in some systems, uh, the process of affirmation is kind of like, I'm going to find five things that I want to say about myself. You know, I am blank, I am blank, I am blank. You know, it's a way of reassuring or whatever, opening up our, what we're trying to claim. But actually, the way we start is by asking people to name what they're seeing or experiencing outside themselves that they are enjoying and that f what, feel, what feels good for them. Um, partly as a way of, like one, one of the things we notice is that, like if I notice the good stuff that's out there, then not only is th it's a, just an interesting point of view to be looking for the good rather than looking for, th for the critique, but also I get to have that experience again. So if I go to a movie and I come out of it and I rehearse all the things I didn't like about the movie, I spent that time in the movie, and then I've come out, and I'm rehearsing all the things I didn't like. What a waste of time, you know, in some ways. Um, but to be able to be aware of the things that, um, that, I, that I appreciated, that I enjoyed, I also get to have that experience again. So we're, we're giving people a direct experience of, well, what does it feel, lo what does it feel like in your body? It feels good. Um, and then it t turns out that in the world, there's just so little oh. affirmation. You know, it, we, we tell stories kind of back and forth about situations where we've just said the simplest thing to people, kind of in recognition of what we were seeing in them, or you know, our appreciation for them, or whatever. And it was like, oh, thank you for saying that. Nobody ever says that to me. Um, and sure. what's up with that? You know, we're all working really hard, and no one is kind of pointing that out. So witnessing is a part. So affirmation is a social reality and interplay more than a personal work that I must achieve to uh, reassure myself. Um, so in witnessing, we're practicing noticing uh, uh, if I notice you and notice what, what's moving about your attention. I could actually say that I'm moved by your attention or by the tears that come to your eyes or I f and I, I, can, I feel connected to that. Um, that would be an affirmation. Right, so it would be an authentic experience of what's happening. And that happens, that witnessing thing happens all the time in interplay. So people are getting fed constantly. I hope, <laughs> I mean, I think each of those pairs, <laughs> but I, more and more they're being given the experience of somebody recognizing them and recognizing something about them. But in addition to that, in order for a person, and I have to just bow in front of the amount of shame that people are enduring um, and living with. I 
you know, again, I don't think there's any easy answer, including a set of affirmations, which I've seen people say over and over and over to a little, you know, effect, a little medicine, like taking vitamin C for a really bad flu. Um, I though think, I, I, I was watching my husband yesterday who had an interview for a job, and he was, he was telling me about it, he was sitting back in his, ch in his chair, and he was like, well, told me that he'd overshared during the interview. <laughs> And he didn't really want the job, so it's not so bad. But I said, well, maybe, you know, like we were, we were noticing his truth. And I said, well, what if you just stood up, you know, stood up on your feet and just claimed that these things are true for you? You don't want the, the job. No, 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 no. And so he did. He stood up, because he's an interplayer. And, he, and w we have this thing that we all stole from Phil, where you take your little, your little stick of inner authority in the top of your little mountain of <laughs> this island. It. You plant it. <laughs> so like, there's this need in a body to kind of go, true, like you do when you stake out something. When the body goes, true, it's like, oh, this is true. That for me is a better affirmation, a more, more of a physical mark in my body, I put my stake down here, than saying over and over to myself, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Because I know I'm not, you know, it's <laughs> like, but, or I'm beautiful, I'm beautiful, I'm not, not really, <laughs> you know, I'm kind of cute, something. <laughs> <laughs> There's all sorts of conditions about, you know, my, my life. So affirmation is social, and I think it's really, when there's something that we're coming up against that, that's harsh or hard or, you know, wobbly in us, it requires some other securing. And, and we do believe that. I, I mean, it's my experience that if I'm, l if I'm less judgmental uh, in yeah. to the the external, that I can also be less ju judgmental. We learn for the to internal. do that more for ourselves. Yeah. So I think it's kind of a, it's an indirect way of getting back to being able to claim what what we even appreciated about ourselves. You know, I did well. I, I just did this thing. Well, I did that part pretty well. I did that part pretty well. When we speak in a made-up language, which sometimes can be, is under the umbrella of what we call babbling, um, the, you know, to be able to uh, be in a speech-like process, you can bring a lot of emotion, which you cannot actually fit into mm. words. You can bring the temperature of experience, the color of experience. So uh, there's so much. Like, I was in a group uh, the other morning and a friend of mine who I know a lot about her current story privately, she was in a group of inner players and we were going around just doing some very brief tellings about things we could talk about and she chose to use this made up speech and nobody in the room went <laughs> 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 but she Definitely, and you know, she's a very incredible storyteller. She could talk, tell you a story to hear and back, but she chose to use that as her communication because she didn't want to get into it. She didn't want to have to explain it. This is not her community of people regularly. So she had a way to bring some of that. Not to mention, what, what can you do intergenerationally? or? What can you do when your mom has Alzheimer's? Mm -hmm. And how do you relate to language in a conversational uh, or connective space that no longer has language as its greatest skill set? And do you mark a person by how well they put their words together? In, my, in the case of my mom, who had Alzheimer's and died from that in 2012, I learned to meet her in the way language was forming and to our track with it. Um, I didn't have to always mirror it. You know, I didn't have to become it, but I could play with that. I wasn't judgmental about it. I wasn't worried about that. I didn't see her identity as her words. You know, her identity is in her body, spirit, something deeper. So having all these ways of accessing, understanding about words and opening that up, not only does it give me you know, all of that grace in relationship, but I get to get freer and freer and wilder and I think better with how I express myself using words.
I always I'm, I'm using that word better a lot. I just have to. <laughs> that's an interesting word. I'm getting better. See, <laughs> I feel I feel good. Let me put that put it that way more simply. I'm feeling good about my capacity, um, about how I'm using words. Celebrating. And we also learn how to celebrate. That's different than affirmation, but like, you know, I made my bed. Yay! <laughs> so like wh this woman I was coaching the other day, she has decided to quit her job and really put her spiritual direction self on the path of, of offering dance as part of her practice. And this was like, she's been doing this bur burned out ministry thing for quite some time. I was like on the other side of the Zoom call, but I was like this, yay! <laughs> woo! <laughs> and she knows me, so she wasn't, you know, thrown. Some people would be. <laughs> but I feel like, why, this is the momentous occasion. Why is there, why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we put our whole body to that and say, this is absolutely fantastic. I actually feel so great about this. You know, that would be, a, to me, a powerful marker. Mm. And th so that's one of the things that we try to encourage, you know. You do not want to go to a, and do a performance and have interplayers show up because they are very loud <laughs> and very <laughs> embarrassing. Because <laughs> we have learned that we have capacity to affirm in such a whole way. It's mm -hmm. fun. I'm not sure if the things that I'm thinking about right now about role playing might be too complicated for this conversation, um, but I think they're really important to me and mysterious. One is that we do not have to integrate everything into one synthesized wholeness. <laughs> that roles are like art forms. So, I want to be able to understand, as we say in our creative practice, I want to know what form I'm in. Oh, I'm in the mother form. Now, I'm in the dancer form. Sometimes they come together in some weird way, you know, but mm -hmm. they are not, like, as a mother, my job is, it turns out, is actually to be, for quite a long while, protective of my you know, my charge, <laughs> uh, and then learn to release, right? Um, that's not specifically my role as a dancer or as a teacher, right? My teacher role might be completely different. So I learned that roles are like art forms, and they have a, a physicality to them, and they have rules and things that I associate to, which I don't normally, thankfully, have to think about. Uh, so oddly, we do not have to integrate or have all of our roles blended into one final me. That's very helpful to me to have learned that. Uh, one of the things that we do talk about and that I use a lot when I'm teaching is the idea of what I call the little body and the big body. And the little body is, um, I'm trying to show you my little body right now where I'm not like jumping up in a performing way, uh, where I'm not going to the edges of time and space with my expanding my, you know, my range of connection to the edges of everything. That biggest body where I'm really open. A body can feel and experience the difference between this little bounded me and this, this bigger me. And that little body and big body are in a sense part of what connects up in roles. Uh, at home, I am more likely to be not only little me, but bad little me. <laughs> 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 Judgmental little me, you know, nagging little me, you know. So I actually have to practice the, the, the little body of my home life as my priority. To prioritize the family, which is in Jewish, you know, wisdom for particularly, is the highest practice to make the home the family, the sacred, the most sacred place. That is my objective because it's the hardest. It's easiest to let it all go there and be in that little body and lose, actually lose role, lose art, lo lose practice, lose ritual. 
So um, the you know a, a lot in my my culture. Uh, my, my experience is that we're being encouraged to get really big. We're encouraged to be magnificent, to get high, you know, high and mighty. And especially women, we've been working pretty hard these last few decades to, you know, show up. And thank God. Uh, but this, that big body is, takes a toll. It, uh, we spend ourselves. It, it, it doesn't sustain itself. And so we don't, also we do not have to integrate these two, right? These are two other things we don't have to. So that expansive self, expansive body spirit that can go all the way out and live at a pretty high vibration, that is also what we see in people like uh, rock stars, you know, celebrities, that when they're out like that. And they usually have to use medication <laughs> to stay out that way. Uh, or they have to learn something about how to do that. I mean, I remember seeing some magnificent politicians in this state who somehow had figured out how to hold that energy without losing, losing their, you know, their connections. So coming back, being in the little me, that's something that I try to teach people, you know, that we can, when we get performative, we can, I call it, f bring up your flaps. We, we can open up. Some people are desperately needing to open their flaps to know that they have a big body and they're freaked out that if they op just open their arms like that, something bad is going to happen to them, probably because something bad has happened to them if they go like this or if their personalities are such that they just don't want to. But the little body, you know, is also a place we need to go um, and learn and we need to, uh, this is old wisdom. This is old people wisdom, you know, how in a village around the fire, the body of the group opens up to this most visionary state. Opens, but then is not required to stay open or to hold on to that or to live from that place. In fact, the highest, most wise people are the freest to not live high, not to live big. You know, they, they know when to do it. They know when to be in their role. Right when it's time to have their medicine, so um, you know if I could if I could teach that you know to more people that would be really magnificent because I think it would take a lot of stress <laughs> off of us as bodies and it does, <coughs> and it's a it's a it's a technology to do that all all people have to do is open their arms feel it feel it down that's pretty pretty much all you have to do and then no you don't have to integrate it and then start practicing how you bless the little so that we put our emphasis back on what's sustainable. I think one of the things we've learned is that um, to have the sorts of practices that we've developed, um, it's really good to be practicing those kind of all the time. So when you're in difficult situations, you have those tools at hand to deal with the really the the challenges. Um, and what better time to want to be drawing on your body wisdom and knowing how your particular body works than when things are going wrong. So when we're sick or when we're ill or even when we're dying, to a certain extent, there will be other people who can help us with that task. But ultimately, we are the ones that have the most efficacy, usually. We're the ones who can say, no, this thing you're trying to do to me, that actually doesn't make things better. It makes it worse. Or once you've done your things and you've left me in my room, what do I do then? You know, so if we have these tools about listening to our experience um, and, and then be able to make good choices out of that uh, is you know, it was a really powerful thing. So, for example, I've, I've had a couple, not, not, not recently, but a while ago, I've had some pretty serious back trouble and a couple of times have been in bed for a while. Um, and one of the things I'd learned early on was that it was actually better for me if I kept working, like uh, even having my laptop and, and working so that I was engaged with something, you know, as opposed to just lying there. So uh, other people might be thinking, well, you should just rest but that didn't really work for me. Um, so to be able to pay attention to that and follow that wisdom. So, the, you know, the play and the fun part, it's like 
that's not necessarily the, en all, the only end result of what we're looking for. It's, it's, it's a good sign. Um, and it's a, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a noble end. If people say, that was fun, you know, we, yes, <laughs> good, <laughs> check that off the list, we've done that. Um, but there's also just all the things that you learn out of, this, out, out of these processes that then you can use in difficult times, mm -hmm. you know, and that's when you need it the most. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to learn those tools when you're in difficult times, mm -hmm. do you know? So suddenly if I'm faced with with whatever, now that's not the time for me to try to learn how to meditate necessarily. It's helpful if I already know how to meditate uh, or any other practice, you know, as opposed to um, when, when the trouble really comes, so. I think we, uh, our colleagues, for instance, Marie Garlock is doing a lot of work with, uh, can around cancer, and her mom died of cancer. She's a uh, PhD in performance studies and an in interplayer. She's teaching doctors and chaplains, as well as cancer survivors uh, and people dealing with it directly, how to have their stories, how to have the personal experience back in the room, um, how to have the body fully present. And, uh, you know, these easy tools and ways that we can do it in without going out and creating a whole dance, right? You don't have to get on a stage. Uh, people being able to bring their story and experience forward in any subject matter uh, is empowering for people. And that whenever people are feeling empowered to have their truth, I think their serotonin increases, their dopamine increases, <laughs> you know, their life force uh, starts to feel cohesive and meaningful. So if, they, if people are dying, living with that, um, we all are dying and living, uh, we are in a sense, better in ourselves. But I mean, I don't know about better, but just where we, we feel well, or more well. That's what I love about improvisation is that there are these things that come out um, that I have not necessarily completely figured out, that I mostly have not figured out beforehand. We're just trying to expand what we might do and see what happens when we do that. And there might be something that's fun in that. There might be something that's illuminating. There might be some that, something that's helpful or releasing or encouraging or uh, whatever that might be. Uh, but mostly what we're, you know, we're asking people to consider this basic question about what does the body do? And then more specifically, what does your body do? Uh, and as we ask people to do these different things, they are behaving in different ways. You could see that as a separation. But, you know, when you use the language of role and role playing, there's the sense of, okay, I'm going to step out of something, you know, and then I'm probably going to step back in. Um, and there, there is a definite stepping in in terms of stepping into the form. So there's just the structural part of, at this point, I'm going to be doing this thing, and I may be behaving in a way that I don't normally behave. Um, but we really see that ultimately as parts of ourselves. And our hope is actually that they can integrate those possibilities in other ways in their lives. So even though there, you know, there are a lot of things that I only do in interplay situations that I don't tend to do in other parts of my life, I might, I could. Um, and oftentimes it's enough for me as an introvert just to imagine I could do that. I could skip down the street. <laughs> I'm probably not gonna, <laughs> but I could. Um, I, so I think, I, I mean, I see it really more as a process of let's let ourselves do what we're capable of doing. Um, and in that process, we're gonna find, we're gonna find other parts. Uh, and whether people experience that as a stepping out of themselves or not is actually, I mean, it's not really my concern uh, personally. Um, I'm sure there are people who have that experience. Oh gosh, who, who was that and who did that thing? And actually, I, I'd have to say that sometimes I have that experience, where did that come from? Um, and I'm kind of at the place where I'm willing to consider that what is coming out, you know, the, the process. Well, for instance, I, you know, creating, using creative practices that are open-ended around a subject like living and dying and how do we do that. I mean, to me, this, these are the old ways. This is like big news, but the old ways ha had these things bound together implicitly. 
rituals and practices that were improvisational. They were not hard set in the ground, you know, the, the ancient ways. They were structured, but they were alive with change. I'm pretty sure. I mean, I wasn't there, <laughs> but I've, you know, in my studies, I'm pretty sure that an open system is inherent to a living system. You know, especially if you don't have books and stuff like that, you've got to have some codification. But people have to know. So, death, I, like I, uh, my, co my, my colleague and husband, Stephen, um, and I do the Dying to Live tour in Cabaret, which uses interplay practices to approach the questions and the body wisdom of death and dying. But we've witnessed quite a bit of it within our community and friends. And for those who are willing, who are already engaged in a practice like this, the ability to notice uh, what their experience or what we call their body data. Uh, and to be able to engage it with creative practice, um, with, some, with some amazing senses of humor, but also really tr deep grief, full on, the full expression. Um, but uh, understand how we begin and end that, that we don't see that as forever, right? Um, the community, uh, communities that gather around people who are going through this process are extraordinary, that we actually can dance on behalf of one another. We can um, leave each other alone, you know, uh, but do so at, at a distance, engage with one another. One of the things that, you know, in our whole way of working has been to back up this process to its kind of most um, basic and incremental steps. So, you know, we don't assume necessarily that a any particular ability um, as people come into our work. Um, and so one of the things that we, you know, I think we understood or we learned was that, um, Actually, the, our focus is to have people describe the details of their lives. When you use the word story, there, uh, there are a bunch of things that seem to be implied by that. A certain kind of structure, first of all, a certain kind of breadth, a certain kind of perhaps seriousness or point or uh, specialness. Like I wouldn't, uh, you know, my story has to, it's gonna go, it has to be like that. Um, and actually, what w one the place that we start is to s is to say, describe your kitchen. You know, in the process of someone doing that, then it turns out that just in that process, they start to reveal themselves. So, for example, if I'm t telling about my my kitchen, describing my kitchen, it's not too long before I'm saying to you, well, actually, uh, my partner Chin his control of the kitchen and <laughs> he just barely lets me into the room, you know? Um, and if I use any pronouns, you're not quite sure, Chin, is that a man or a woman? But pretty soon you figure out, oh, my partner is a man. So just by talking about my, my kitchen, I come out to you. So that's part of the kind of this wisdom of talking about the, the, the details of people's lives. And that's where we start. Um, and, you know, what we keep, I think what we keep learning is that people they just want to, they want to be heard, they want to be witnessed, and part of our structure is to make sure people have time for that. Um, you talk, uh, and I listen, mm -hmm. and then we trade. Um, and even just that change in the structure, it's not a conversation, but we d we're going to take turns, and you're just going to listen to me for a while. And I find for myself that, like, I may not have a need to tell my story, but I have stuff to share that I'm experiencing, that I'm thinking about, that I'm, mm -hmm. that, you know, whatever, that it's just interesting to me to have someone else. It's in interesting for me to be able to say it. And in that process, I might learn something from it. So again, because our, our process starts with the creative process as opposed to the, uh, the imagination, first of all. So it's not like, okay, I'm gonna figure out my story, then I'm gonna tell it to you. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start, and I'm gonna see where that takes me. You know, so I, I may not know where it, it takes me. Uh, and that's part of the revelation is, oh, well, where did this story go? Um, 
as we start to hear stories, then we s obviously we start to learn more about each other at that really basic level, and we start to create connection. Um, so it's like now we know each other a little bit better, and because of the structure, we tend to go. We do tend to go further in. So we're not just starting with the niceties of conversation. We're saying something specific. It may not be terribly personal, but it's going to be specific, um, and it's going to lead somewhere. So. The, the, create, the, the creating the connection is a really, I think, important part, whether that's just in a two-person thing or whether it's with an audience or uh, you know, a small group or whatever. Um, and then it's out of that that we start to make these bigger meanings. Um, but that's not always where we start. We know, OK, I, this is something I want to tell you about. I know that much, uh, or that I might tell you about. It doesn't even have to have a huge amount of intention to it. Um, or impulse, um, but I have something that I'm going to share with you, um, maybe because of a prompt, it may because I've just chosen, uh, and something comes up. And for some reason, that's the thing that comes up. So um, there must be something to that, and let's look at that. Let's just notice. So that's the other thing that we do. We do these things, and then we notice. What, what happened when I said that? What did I, what came up? Was I surprised at what I said? Uh, was I surprised at what my partner said? Or what did I hear in what my partner said? Or how did we connect? All those things happen in that process of telling stories. So it's another way to elicit, uh, elicit information in our, both our own and other people's. Um, you know, I think it, it's, uh, first of all, it's an end in itself. Uh, so our process is incremental. I would say that all of the steps are, can have power and meaning. Uh, but it's also where we're headed. Uh, so there's something about what becomes possible when we first start on, out on these little steps. And um, you know, my feeling about stories is that is that we have been taught to be really careful about our words, um, and we're really a little bit nervous about the judge judge part of that. And the metaphor I often use, it's like you know, the place where we where we construct our words um, and our judge, those are like really close together, like, um, you know, motel, sometimes you're in a motel room and there's <laughs> actually a door between your room and the next room, and it's locked, but you like never know when it's gonna fly open. And it's kind of like that, I think, with storytelling. It's like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make words, I'm gonna put some words together, but the judge could come out and rah. Um, so first of all, we're just teaching people to be easy around words and playing with words um, as, you know, here's, here's a thing. You can play with your words, and we, um, uh, and so we're doing all those little steps, and even and, the, and the, even the first steps are often amusing and interesting and entertaining. But we're also getting people to the place where they really can tell the important stories, you know, the stories that need to be told, the stories that have, you know, a, a big heart connection, the stories that are the things that are on our mind, you know, whatever those might be. I mean, they don't have to be. They don't have to be big and meaningful, but they can be. Um, so, really, what we're trying to do is, you know, ultimately, is get to this place where we have the freedom, you know, to have what comes out of telling a story and having someone else witness it, which is, you know, a powerful thing. Sometimes that's all we need is for someone to hear, mm -hmm. hear the story. You don't have to, you know, give me your advice about what I might have done, or you don't have to. It doesn't. You don't have to do anything necessarily. It was. It's just helpful if I can just say it and to have someone else there to witness it. So, um, you know, there are, you know, what, what, we, what we think are a million benefits to, to being able to do that um, that are both simple and profound from just it's fun, which is great. I had a good time. I, I filled up three minutes <laughs> and, you know, I wasn't mortified. Um, Success! And, and that's a something. And then this uh, much longer arc to our work, which is really, I'm, I'm paying attention to the way that my body works. I'm learning what my own body wisdom is. I'm going to apply that. And I'm going to use that to construct, you know, my own life and try it and whatever effect that has on the lives around me, which we hope is a positive thing. We're, we're both rabid readers. We read constantly. Um, and we write constantly. So, I mean, I have a regular daily writing practice. Uh, I just want to note that the beauty, 
the art of well-chosen and power, I mean, it changes lives. That's why I think we're kind of addicted to it. It, it does change. It cr memes, strategies, it's so powerful. It's, but it's sort of like having, you know, like a bunch of weapons. You, we know we can pull these out, you know. Um, is, that the, is that sustainable? Is that good for the body without balance? I don't, that's, I don't think it is. I think our bodies are tired of a certain levels of, of bearing the weight of words um, in general. And the people that are now being drawn to this way of working that's more balanced, I feel, are people who have had a long history with language. Um, spiritual directors, chaplains, um, you know, executives, people who've had to walk a long way. I am very grateful to my early teachers, including Judith and um, Robert McAfee Brown again, who when I, when I was resistant to language because I really felt the language that I'd received was battering, literally battering. Uh, it was, language can be as abusive to the body uh, and not just by the meaning, but by the force of it. And I'm sometimes guilty myself. Uh, so they would, they taught me that words were dancers. And this is very helpful. And it goes back to my own theological body memory of logos and the word being with us and among us. And so a body and a word, a word dancing, you know, that began to turn me from fear of language to liberating a holy way for words. When are my words dancing? When am I creating spaces where words dance? Those are the kind of questions that I, I try to ask. And I feel like I stumble around, you know, I, t I talk too much, you know, now. It's like, blah, 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 like a released faucet. Um, but I, I think the problem of language is that there is more, there's more impact than we realize. And I've been thinking and practicing around the word trigger, which uh, writing teacher Deanna, uh, Dina uh, Metzger told, asked, requested that we not use the word trigger. Oh, I was triggered. And why? Because she says that word is violent itself. So when we speak of being affected, impacted, can we say some other word? So I've been practicing saying stimulated. I got stimulated. I got ignited. Something different than a gun word. And I notice as I practice with a simple, one simple different word, I feel a different uh, way of being in my body. Now I'm super like in touch and care about that. But we know from feminism, we know from so many things that words have Words have power, they can step <laughs> on toes. Use a wrong word, get a bloody nose. That was something that Phil <laughs> rapped about at one point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'd, uh, uh, it's, it's just such, uh, such an interesting part, I think, of, I don't know who, who the crowd is that um, do this, but it's a lot of people in my crowd um, really think that we can solve problems through language. Um, and. I'm kind of coming to the conclusion that I'm not sure, so sure that's true, that we think if we change our language, somehow we'll get to um, something else. And I think there's an element of that. But you know, I think a lot of what we're doing in our own work is we're teaching people several languages. You know, we're showing people, oh, well, there's, um, there's the kind of language that we normally use and, um, in kind of our everyday situations, but then there's a move. And even just to move into a made up language um, has a different kind of quality to it. You know, if, if, uh, if, if I was in an argument with someone, if we just used made up language in the argument, we'd probably be much better off, you know. <laughs> um, and then we're t teaching people um, about sound and about um, about singing and um, and even the language of the body. So, you know, again, it's like 
but you know, it's great that, we've, that we got this language thing and we wrangled with it and we decided that we weren't going to have 25 different spellings for, you know, for each word and you know, we're going to get rid of some of those funny characters they had <laughs> in the Middle Ages. You know, and, um, you know, it's really great that we were careful about that. Um, and I also know I carry, uh, there's a piece of me that carries this, this thing about there's a right way to use the language. And I'm going to notice if you have not matched up your subject and your verb, <laughs> you know? Um, and I th ultimately, I think that's problematic. Um, and again, I think for, for some people, it's really helpful right, that we have people who know how to do that, who can go back and clean up my language. I like that. <laughs> um, and I value that. I value clear writing and clear thinking. Um, and I also know that languages can be really messy and that if we're too buttoned up around it, then we're, again, we're going to be stuck in, in, stuck in our ruts. And we're going to be paying more attention to that than what we're trying to say or what we're trying to do or what our intention is or, or whatever. So I think we're, in, in our work, we're trying to create a space where people can loosen up about that. And again, what they discover is that, oh, you know, well, it's fun, it's revelatory, it's community building, it's awe-inducing, awe you know, all of these things that can happen um, out, of, out of playing, being able to play with language. And, you know, of course, the, even the, the best writers in, in the canon were often people who, who messed around with the way, mm. they, um, the way they talked and the way they wrote and the way mm. they told stories, and thank yeah. God. And our approach means that we're open to the mystery of the process, right? We're opening up that stories are coming out of a place that we don't always know what it is. So when it comes straight through the body, um, we, we keep it, we keep a safe space by making it short enough. Yeah. <laughs> and by telling people, you know, you get to start and you, we practice these things. Start, begin, we'll 30 end. seconds. 30 seconds. Yeah. Like you don't have to go on and on and there's not a lot of pressure around the subject matter. As people get used to that, then this uprising of and mystery of what words and language and thoughts and ideas and meaning are trying to say is an opening to mystery. Mm -hmm. And you're going to do a lot of it. So yes. it's not just one. Like, I don't just have one chance to tell one right. story. We're actually, probably in a particular situation, we'll have several opportunities to be. And again, uh, I don't think when we teach, we say, now get ready. We're going to open to mystery. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, wait, quite sometimes the I say that <laughs> when I'm teaching this form as an introduction, you know, a, a telling process. And that's, I emphasize telling when I talk about it rather than the language of story. Um, I just, you know, say some of the best part of this is no, me noticing what I'm telling. Not being worried so worried about what the person, what you're hearing, my partner, but what comes to me. And the fact then that there's actually choices that I get to make. Um, so I can learn to craft right from the beginning. Do I want to say that? I have a choice. Mm -hmm. Choice for me is a dynamic of play. Uh, to be able to see what I want to do, to play with it, mm. rather than just a <laughs> you yeah, know. And then that cr it's the craft that also <laughs> elicits different information. Yeah. So if I know that I, have, I might have my words, but I might also have sounds, I might have singing, I might, have, I might be combining movement with that. Um, and all those, things are, all those things are possible. And when I use those things, how does it change what comes out? Um, or, or how it's perceived. Um, and so that, again, there's a lot more range and more to learn from, more to notice, um, as well as just the kind of delight of making things, of creating things. And which seeing is, people make things. Yeah. Which is more entertaining than watching most television, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. So that delight, you know, the delight of creating. We, all, we talk a lot about 
focusing on creating. This is what this, this is what we're going to do. We're coming together. We're going to create. It might be healing. We know that it is, um, but that's not where we put our focus. Um, we put our focus on what what are we making? What's this? What's the story? Or what's the dance? Or what's the song? Or what's the way we combine all those things together? Um, or as we sing together, you know, how, whatever it is that we're doing, we're going to pay attention to what we're uh, what we're creating. And, and that's just fun, you know, for, for the people who like to create. We know a secret. We know a secret. We know a secret. It's in your eyes. We know. Time. <laughs> well, we know time is a construct. So, we don't have to use only one construct of time. The fact that we have, you know, Cynthia was looking at this idea of the construct of time, that, you know, we've organized time in seconds and minutes and hours and days, and, uh, and we know that that's part of our experience of time, but we also know that sometimes it feels like um, like when I, I have <laughs> this funny experience when I go to the gym, I can hardly imagine that in a couple of hours I'm actually going to be putting on my clothes to leave. It's like, <laughs> is this never going to end? <laughs> um, and then there are other times when, you know, I can be doing something and a couple of hours will pass and, oh, wow, what happened there? Um, so, you know, it's, it's like it's an effect, it's an experience, and we know that if you do particular things, you, you, you're likely to have that experience. Uh, and that is kind of the way that we work. Um, we, can't, we can't necessarily guarantee it. We can't say, this is what you're going to get out of it. This is, this is what's going to happen to you. But, but fairly consistently, um, at points in this process that we lead people through, that happens. And it's, you know, again, we're, we're al almost always returning to experience. So if you can, it, and again, whether, whether timelessness, having the sense of time, like we, th we think the time, that sense, which you, some, we used to call flying time sometimes. We, that, now, that didn't really kind of catch on <laughs> in our whole community. But, you know, what, time flies when you're having fun, that idea. Um, we don't necessarily hold that as, okay, this is what we're trying to create, and, and so that's our job, is to create that sense. It, it seems to be an experience that comes along with what we do, and we know that that is um, generally a good experience for people, you know, when they can get out of that. So, um, and what we believe is that that's good for the body, both in the short term and the long term. Um, in general, what we would say is that if if we pay attention to the things that feel good in the body, and these are the things that um, are good for us now and also good later. There are a bunch of things that feel good now but are bad for us, you know, in the long term. Um, so we want to be able to make that distinction. But if we pay attention to the things that really feed us, that enliven us, that give us energy, that uh, give, gives us a sense of openness, or even those bigger experiences of awe or timelessness or whatever, um, that we believe that those experiences are good not just in the moment, but they they're having an effect on our bodies in the long term as well. And you know, it's been interesting for us that fairly consistently the, the, br the brain people have been confirming what we've been teaching. That's, that's always <laughs> fun. <laughs> We're able as craftspeople to <coughs> create well, anytime you have an open enough circle, uh, you can bring whatever level of intellect or interest or desire you have. So by not describing too tightly what people have to do, there's a lot of room for people to be engaged. Uh, and then things can be very short so they don't feel overwhelmed. If people don't feel engaged or they feel overwhelmed, time is going to go really slow. Right? So. Like as craft, crafting an experience, we're paying attention to physical elements of how, how you create a sense of flow, um, how you create a sense of engagement that f 
feel like it's uh, alive and where you stop thinking about time, right? Or stop thinking about how bad you feel or how good you feel. You're, you're not focused on yourself. You're focused on something happening. And that is in the neighborhood of timelessness. Um, so it's a beautiful thing to, <laughs> you know, I feel like I'm in the, in the magic shop a lot of time as a teacher because um, I've learned a lot of these skills that, you know, people only over in the dance department learn. You wouldn't want to go there because why would anything good happen there? You know, like choreography, time, space, energy. Why do you think dance has been so discounted? It's the magic shop. Time, space, energy, power. Dance is a virtual realm of power. The powers of interaction and intersection. So like timelessness, you know, all you have to do is start a drum. Get the rhythm going and people s suddenly are not thinking about time. Isn't that weird? I love that. I've had this experience over and over again teaching the way that we teach um, is that we move people through a particular process and there's there's a particular result and people are kind of amazed at the result yes and you know I hear in I hear kind of the ama the amazement in that but since I've led this process people through this process many times with the same result right you know it's learning is pretty predictable that this happens and you know my this is my own crackpot brain theory um, is that you know, as we think about some of these bigger, bigger experiences, are timelessness, or you know, however we want to describe those, that you know, those are things that are happening in a particular part of the brain. And what I believe is that actually that part of our brain only gets activated by movement and activity. So it's not th at, at this point in the function. You know, our our, our nervous systems are set up so that. Uh, there's information going from our brain out to our nervous system, and there's information that's coming in from our in, uh, nervous system that's informing our brain. So, I, you know, I think what what I kind of believe is that by activating these various processes, whether it's moving or singing or telling stories or or, or having stillness or being in contact with other people, that we're waking up certain parts of the brain where those experiences are activated. That that's where that happens. I mean, it doesn't really matter ultimately physiologically. But what we know is that what I, what I keep noticing is that, that it's through activity, it's through the body doing something that we get to that place. Mm. And so we ask people to do those things, and that thing happens. And it happens consistently, pretty <laughs> consistently. And it it's happens. science! <laughs> it's a science. We just didn't write it down and get a grant and all that. And it doesn't seem to matter so much about um, <laughs> you know, geography or, mm -mm. or, or culture. Um, culture or race or age or whatever, that, that it's pretty, um, pretty consistent. And this is not, I mean, we didn't make this stuff up. Uh, ultimately, this other, other peoples have learned, have known about this forever. We're just, um, I think, in, in maybe in Western culture, we just have this particular task of, of, of rediscovering that the, this truth that we've been cut off from. I want to share another thing from the magic shop. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, uh, this has been so important to me because it's a, such a big issue for me. And it has to do with how connected bodies are one to another. Um, like f early on, I just love the feeling of being in a choir, right? Um, that sense of ensemble, like I could feel it. And I was like, whoa, that, be that together feeling? Or being in a dance. And what happens when your bodies sync up as a whole group? Or I was uh, the, the president of the drill team in my high school um, <laughs> in California. And, you know, 100 girls. And we could get ourselves synced up. And it's like, what that feels like, you know, when something like that is happening. And then you could kind of reverse that idea. And what am I syncing up to out here? That that's so physical. And I love that feeling. Well, I, you know, over time, I feel like by dancing and by being in my body in a certain way, I, I learned when I was in sync and when I was out of sync. And I also learned that I, when I was syncing up with stuff I didn't want to be in sync with, like, ah, you know, I, ah, it was horrible. Um, it's so over, and then over time through our practice of improvising that we could actually create, be in sync without choreography. Wow, that is so cool. How can that be? 
Well, now we know that mirror neurons, which are the com one of the components that they look at in attachment for healthy relationships, mirror neurons are actually these the part of us that's creating that in sync feeling, which, what, what we used to call kinesthetic identification, the ability to identify in our body with the movement of another. So if I go like that, you know, or if I go, hum, 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 your body, if we're in sync, will st soon start having that feeling, even if you're just sitting there. Uh, that is a dance thing. It's an athlete thing. You, we rely on that in physical arts. But that's a thing that's happening in business. And people are actually manipulating us with this, right? And they are t entraining us. They are entrancing us. Um, and they're also, it can be done for the good, right? Because we're, we're so, this is how I know that one body, when one body suffers, another body suffers. When one body rejoices, another rejoices. Our bodies are in sync. And we're meant to be this way. And it's when people aren't able to be in sync that there's illness, right? So by dancing or, or in training that through any physical form, building it up and building awareness about it, we can be more, I think, skillful. And I can actually learn to tolerate being out of sync as part of a necessary part of the dance. And I can learn how to differentiate and let go of that, this person being in sync with this person in this way. And I don't have to call that lack of peace, right? I can let go. And that's physical. Again, it's, these are, this is all rooted in physiology. It's not a, just a, my idea in my head. So that, that too, is, this is like a whole other part of the, the wild and wonderful thing of being embodied and actually knowing, having choices to play with that is a part of the highest creative form of dance and just this little thing of like us being here in sync and occasionally probably wondering if we are. <laughs> you know, <laughs> are we in sync? <laughs> I don't know. Um, so yeah, mirror neurons and, and again, something that science has now proven. But that is trained in the arts. Even when we started the work that we're doing, you know, Cynthia and I have been collaborating for 30, almost 39 years now. Um, and even the, the, the more recent part about uh, Interplay, which is more like 20, 28, 29 years. Um, oh gosh, that sounds so long. I know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I've been pretty lucky at, at actually figuring th those things out and, and paying attention either quite consciously or sort of consciously to what I was supposed to do um, and what was going to be best for me and where my gifts lined up with, you know, the need in the world, what I perceived, what I might have perceived that to be. Um, so that's the main thing I think that there's, I've managed to find a kind of um, st stasis, stasis isn't a very good word because I feel like everything is constantly moving, but this kind of balance between what it is that I'm particularly good at and I feel called to do and the gifts that I seem to be have given and, you know, all the other parts of me that might make it possible for me, for example, to sustain working on a movement for 30 years, you know, even that, or to have a, a collaborative relationship that lasts almost 40. Um, I mean, some of that I just, I just chalk up to, you know, genetics um, or upbringing. So one of the words I use a lot to talk about um, what I feel like I, one of the things I try to, that I have tended out to live, tended to live out in my life is to be steadfast, which I think goes back to my upbringing and, you know, there are a bunch of steadfast people in my life, so it doesn't surprise me that I might be one too. Uh, so it could be something as simple as, okay, I'm willing to plod. I, kn I know the value of plodding. Um, and I often say I've not really had any big ideas, but I've had a lot of small ideas that have added up to big ideas. <laughs> um, and so I'd somehow I've kind of had, I, I had either knew that or was willing to follow the path that was 
leading in that direction. So that's really what sustains me is that it's in line. Um, the things that I might be doing and um, that I'm capable of doing or good at doing and the things that I enjoy that feed me, um, that's what makes it possible just to keep going on and on. And you know, as an artist, as a creator, uh, to use that to use that frame, that understanding is is a helpful t uh, a helpful frame too when you're thinking about uh, organizational life. Like one of the things that I do is I I'm, I'm really interested in how organizations work um, and have had a, a number of opportunities to kind of have have that play out to be able to use and kind of mess with institutions and organizations so that they can work well. Um, so I'm just interested in how um, how that how that process works, um, and and as an artist, I can see that organizational project uh, process as a giant art project. So let's say this work that we've done over the last um, thirty some years, you know, I just think of it as a as a as a really big art project, which means I'm willing to do the little the little things that will keep the project going. You know, if you're an, artist, whatever your form is, you have to do all these nitpicky little things, you know, you have to clean the brushes and you know, whatever the thing is that you do, you have to put in the hours, you have to do the little steps, you have to, you know, even the th parts of it that you don't particularly like in order to get the result you want. Um, and so it's helpful for me to have that frame of, you know, this is just like a giant art project. I often talk about the you know things that the ac there, there's there are accidents and there's providence um, and I'm definitely a believer in providence but I also understand that that's that's a belief you know that thing that happened was that an accident or was that providence um, but to have um, a collaborative relationship I mean that's kind of amazing I think for two people who are, especially two people who aren't married uh, who aren't partners uh, to work together for so long or so so closely and so intimately. Um, so I've been really lucky uh, over time, um, in particular in this relationship with Cynthia, but in, with other collaborators as well. Well, I just was just leading a little group, and my truest service, I believe, is if, like St. Teresa of Lisieux, if I could be really the little flower that I am. Um, it's very hard for me to believe that in my culture, to be a flower in a garden. I mean, I'm a human being. What is my service? You know, um, so like on a on a on the most primitive spiritual level, that you know, I would like to be that. That that is what I hope to be. But as a you know, as a creator, as a maker, the to to be an artist uh, is such a prophetic, um, blessedly challenging, beautiful, gifted. Uh, service. Oh, I'm so lucky. I just count my blessings every day that I'm an artist and that Phil and I have figured out how to hold ourselves, you know, financially uh, stable enough that we can, you know, remain artists because <laughs> I think that's very hard. Um, that, but that to be an artist, to be of service as an artist is, and not to have to tie finances to the, to the, to the flow, but to the, you know, the productive elements, the technology itself, you know, that's, uh, that is a service. Like, this will far outlive us, um, as so my friends tell me. Um, and I believe them, uh, especially when people of color tell me that. This will outlive you, and we, your, our children will benefit from this. I don't know how many of them, there you know, could be five or <laughs> could be 5,000, but um, that's a service if people are more uh, loving, gracious, kind, full, uh, healthy, and not necessarily bigger and better <laughs> like I'm trying to be. <laughs> yeah. My dad was a lover, you know, an expressive, crazy engineer. And, you know, he hugged me. 
in such fullness, and so did my, you know, my mom. You know, I, I'm so lucky. <sighs> so the, that parental love, um, I found very foundational. I know that both Bill and I have had that. We're very lucky, because I know how that's not, that doesn't come to everybody. Um, but then with also within that, I was anointed by an energy beyond, from beyond. And that energy was unconditional and it was neutral. It wasn't some mushy-gushy love. It was bizarre. It was like, it lit me up in a way, it gave me a point of contact for a love that, like no other. And for 30 seconds, like an earthquake, I felt that love as unconditional. And that I was like looking from that point of view at everything unconditionally. I felt it in my body, what that love feels like, you know, from my experience. And it's unconditional and it's <coughs> neutral. And what did that do? It evoked my love. It evoked a torrent of endless desire to respond to that. And, you know, that little moment is what woke up this, well, what can I do? How can I serve? And, and that's what woke up the idea of trying to hold dance and religion together, which was my question. You know, how can I you know, take who I am? And that seemed to be what came up in that moment. Um, but whatever it is, I, you know, even if that, I mean, that's like, like one of the questions I'm at constantly. It's not just dance or religion, it's body and soul, and it's like creating and, you know, the, what do these art, human arts do? And like, I just come at that every day with, now I don't even think about it, but it's probably that same response to that moment. Like, it's endless. I, I can't. Or I'm just irrepressible, <laughs> 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 which someone has said about me. But I, I feel like that is, um, I feel like Phil and I do share a kind of a template, a beat on a kind, this, whatever this love is that doesn't require anything back. I personally do, but that love doesn't. You know, and I think somehow we found each other. So, and there's a like it's so efficient uh, when we are generally working well together. We don't ask a lot. We don't. We're we don't have to because there's a fire that isn't. You know, that's very cool and it's pretty constant. Um, and and also get, we have a lot of separation from each other as well. It doesn't require us to be in side of each other's everything. As a as a as an artist, I feel like too, I'm not even I'm not even required to keep doing anything the same. I'm not required to do anything. I can I have a shrine workshop, you know, I go off and do all sorts of art things. Uh, I'm not required by this to do anything. So that kind of freedom, wow. If it, if I you know maybe maybe my life work is just to see if I could get anywhere in the neighborhood of igniting that for another person as a human being, you know if I could just pass any of that on, that would be, you know, successful, and I I know I have, it's been in the neighborhood, you know, so that's a it's a transmission you know, <laughs> maybe that's what a good you know good teacher can do is hopefully transmit some some of the good that they're getting. And they've been lucky to get. If you go back to body and soul times, all of us, Judith and Cynthia and I, were all kind of looking at this question of physicality and spirituality. Um, because we knew we had all been attracted to dance in one way or another, and we knew what happened to us as we moved, and then what happened to us as we used dance and choreography as a means of exploring various ideas. Um, and then also having to deal with the challenge of uh, physicality in most Christian tradition, where there's quite a split between body and spirit. And so that's what 
we were trying to kind of bring back together and to find some language to talk about that to teach people. And so when we were working, we were often doing a combination of performance and workshops and maybe dancing and worship or whatever. Um, so the, the process of articulation was really important to us. Uh, we would, I think our concerts were almost more like lecture demonstrations and they were kind of straight concerts. Although one of the things we were also trying to hold was that we wanted the choreography to work in dance situations as well, that we could perform in dance, uh, in dance theaters, theaters yeah. um, and do kind of straightforward dance performances that, and that the choreography would stand up um, in those settings, whether you had that kind of spiritual background or, or not. Um, so that was really, you know, it was that inter integrating process that was it, there from the very beginning um, in terms of what we were exploring and what we were trying to convince people of, um, and also how that, you know, just what we kno knew of our own experience uh, of kind of exploring these the bigger questions about life and meaning and whatever, and that uh, the arts and dance in particular could be really interesting avenues for that. Yeah, my dad was, uh, his people had lived in Indiana for some time and were, my grandfather worked at the Delco electronics plant outside of Kokomo, that's where I was born. Um, I was, you know, in the wee stages when my dad was at Purdue University coming, kind of crawling out with through intellect and some recognition, a sort of a staunch young Methodist character and a cross country runner. He found my mom when he was in the Navy and moved her back there, baby me, and up, you know, through the, through this beginning in Indiana, but a feeling of never really losing connection. I don't know, I don't understand. That's mysterious, I think, place the meaning of place even if you lose, leave or, I think my dad was escaping. <laughs> um, my dad escaped and took us to Los Angeles. I grew up there in the southern, uh, the South Bay of Los Angeles, wound up in high school, having a United Methodist for a public school dance teacher. My grandparents were northern Indiana folks and so, the first 18 years of my life um, was living in in southern Indiana. And, and while I was at Indiana University, I had been studying um, textual artwork uh, with a guy named Bud Stalnecker. And um, I had continued to do textile artwork after I finished at IU. Um, and as I was discerning what to do in terms of graduate school, I took my work to him. He was actually in Indianapolis having back surgery. And I took, and I had this garbage bag full of my artwork. I took it to the hospital. I can remember he had a pair of duck slippers. He was kind of a character. Um, and he looked at the stuff and he said, well, you know, if there's one thing that you should do, you should go to Berkeley and study with Ed Rosbach, who's a textile artist, quite well-known textile artist uh, at the time, who was at UC Berkeley. And my journey as an artist um, was kind of a, uh, a certain mixture of obliviousness in that, you know, not having, not having kind of all uh, various markers to understand for, for people to kind of recognize and say, or for me to recognize and say, oh, you're an artist. Uh, that took a long time for me to figure out. But I did make that, got to that fork in the road, chose the art path, and um, kind of never looked back. All these other things happened when I went to Berkeley that I couldn't have anticipated. Uh, so it was, you know, that part of it, the, that's kind of more mysterious part, you know, how you end up someplace yeah. that turns out to be the right place. Yeah. Uh, we were both part of a dance company called Body and Soul Dance Company. And this was a group that was started by um, a woman named Judith Rock. Uh, and I had come into contact with her through a performance she actually did at my church uh, in Berkeley, a church that I joined when I moved to California. 
Um, and <clears throat> Judith was often choreographing pieces with lots of people in them. And at one point, not too long after I met her, she invited me to dance in, in one of these pieces. And then I sort of became part of this collective of people. They kind of treated themselves as a collective. This was the 70s. Um, great time for collectives. Glad we got that out of our system. Um, <laughs> But we you know, kind of became part of that community. Um, and then not too long after that, um, she remounted the piece with a slightly different group of people. And I think that's when Cynthia first came in, into the group. Um, and at that point, there, partly because Judith often created pieces with more people in them, there were, were there a number of people around. Um, but Cynthia had left for a bit to do an, an internship uh, in Washington State. And during the time that she was gone, uh, Judith and I and another, another colleague kind of decided to shrink the company down to three people so that we could travel easily. And about the time we were making that decision, Cynthia came back. And we realized that she was supposed to be the third person. So it was Judith and Cynthia and I. And so for then the next you know, six or seven or eight years, um, the three of us danced together. So that's where we first met each other. And there was this really lively, um, kind of art, art and theology crowd in Berkeley that, was, that revolved around the seminaries out there, in particular um, Pacific School of Religion, which was part of the Graduate Theological Union. This little company that we had for a while uh, was really where we first uh, worked together. Um, and then Judith moved to New York um, with her husband when her, her husband took a job there. And we all kind of, Cynthia and I went our separate ways for a little bit, but then came back together and decided to pick up some of the threads that are uh, continue on some of the threads that were developing in that company, but also to take it off into a slightly different and slightly broader uh, direction. And that's when we really started uh, Interplay. You know, I can't say enough for the importance of the whatever was happening at that time in the 70s and probably the 60s to the 70s when there was beginning to be the shift between an art an art moment that was about form and it was shifting back to narrative and shifting back towards meaning and i was coming across all the arts we were kind of both trained in the art for art's sake part but our predecessors before that, people were really using, shifting the nature of the body, shifting the nature of dancing uh, out of the ballet and kind of a, sort of a hierarchical point of view to a more uh, organic approach, even though I'm not sure Martha Graham was very organic um, sometimes. But this deep, uh, these deep waves and following in the men at the 70s, the, the, meaning, the meaning of story narrative, uh, who are we? And when I was in seminary at Pacific School of Religion, my professor Robert McAfee Brown was very interested in story and narrative. And so, was the, so the preaching movement began to have that, those colors. And the folks in the Sacred Dance Guild movement had been rising up for some years, and the leaders in that had formed a very cohesive community of mostly women, not, com not exclusively, but Phil and I were fortunate to be considered teachers in that place. Anywhere where we've been able to teach, we've been able to, I think, cultivate not only how does, how does body, body wisdom, how does spiritual intelligence you know, work on this level, <laughs> on this level of the basement, um, right where we are, um, how do we get it to shine? How do we get it to, to emanate? Um, how do we find freedom uh, together? How do we tap the love thing in the most direct way? How do we, how do we get beyond difference and, mm. and, and, and appreciate it? So those kinds of questions were, we saw that improvisation which I would call the ability, you know, it's a craft that teaches you how to do the not foreseen, but it's based in everything that you know, and it's like jazz based in forms. Improvisation, we both have a kind of magical gift, and I would call it magical, you know, that when we improvise together as dancers, it just showed up. And then Phil, I think, was particularly gifted at improvising with story. And these desires, like what can our bodies do they built this like 
practicing and playing and then growing into a company that we call Wing It Performance Ensemble, who are all professional artists who are similarly it delighted by crafting for an audience. Um, so not just the experience or the process, but the, but the presentation. Can we make something that's worth seeing? And so our questions have been also under that discipline, not just experience and how do we feel, but how does the, you know, how does communication happen? What are we in service to? Hmm. Um, what, and the disciplines of that. So, and that's, tho those learnings in Wing It are what, ha what then compelled us to keep, it, well, to, to find a network of people, growing network that, of people that were curious about similar things. I think these are people we now call seekers. You know, people who are asking questions and wanting a lived experience, which, which we now call spirituality. A lived experience of connection, of creative life, of inquiry. We need creative practices that really allow a diversity of voices and bodies. And while the two of us are representative here of, a, of white people, um, the future of what we're practicing is our investment is in complexity. So both gender uh, fullness and also uh, cultural fullness and uh, also mental health diversity. So we're not fixating on people becoming better, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> mentally. You know, that some of us are, are, will be living in different stages of mental health at any given time, or physical health uh, in terms of our bodies and that. So generation, all of that, that creative practice and this kind of practice, I know wants to be the earth the body itself wants it to have complexity and wants to be expressed as such. So in the future, uh, uh, that is what will rise out of this practice. I know because that's what we're working on. Some, sometimes I use um, Star Trek The Next Generation as, a, as kind of an example of how in that, in that particular show there were, you know, these whatever, eight or nine characters, the main characters, and each of them did a kind of slightly different thing. Um, and that really the magic of the, of the crew was that everyone brought their particular gifts to bear. So there was the empath, but it was like everyone didn't need to be an empath. Right. Um, and there was the warrior, not everyone needed to be the warrior. There was the engineer, not everyone needed to be the engineer. And I think one of the things that, you know, even after 30 years, I'm not really sure if, my guess is that actually we've attracted people to our work who have a particular set of interests and skills. And it's really helpful in community to have at least some people who have those skills and that they're transferable into the community. They can affect the entire community. In the same way, there are a bunch of other people with, uh, with important skills that, 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 bring, that can be brought to bear for the whole community. That, that, and it's kind of, it kind of mixes in with the diversity idea that you really the power of um, community is that you can have a bunch of different people who bring different things to the table. And that, the combined body wisdom is going to be better than any of our individual body wisdom. I mean, this has been true in my collaboration with Cynthia, that we just, we just know that if she's got an idea and I've got a slightly different idea, that if we keep wrangling until we find a place that's somewhere in between, that's not a diminishment of either point of view, but the best kind of integration, that's going to be better. And that if there are even more bodies involved in that, that it's, that it's going to be better. And that's the way our work has evolved, is, um, is a lot of people have had an influence on it. Yes. Um, that it's con and that continues to grow and change. So, d but I think two things, both the importance of different gifts and different skills, recognizing that that's true, that we don't all have to be the same, um, but, there are, but all of these gifts are important. We, can't, we shouldn't discount them. Um, and also that, um, we're really the combined body wisdom is going to be more powerful than any of the ideas we have as individuals and that we should figure out some ways to work on that. Yeah. <laughs> so. The other thing that I'm thinking about a lot and trying and beginning to give language to is spiritual intelligence as the 
cumulative intelligence of all of the intelligences. Uh, Phil and I were talking about this on the plane and how really when we say body wisdom, we're talking about spiritual intelligence. We're talking about mind, body, heart, spirit. Now, spirit is, is just as this animating connective force. Uh, so the most ground level way of thinking and talking about this. Spiritual intelligence having the whole body, spirit, body intellect lit up at, at whatever level it is there. Um, I really think that naming that, having a way to language that without being in a religious or even spiritual conversation like, oh, spirituality, like what are the practices, you know, spirituality, but really understanding this, you know, fullness as important. I w I'm going to say sacred you know, to the level of, you, you use the word ultimate meaning, um, that it has, it's crucial now. It's crucial now and for the future. It's probably been cru crucial. But with our planetary issues, our growing population, our struggles now, when we're up against each other like this, we can't find space. Now we have to, we have to find and apply this. And so spiritual intelligence, or you know, what I in my own life will call ensoulment, the feeling of that deepest self really coming fully into, you know, flower. Uh, that's one of the things I'm, I'm hoping to talk about and think a lot about with other people in the future. Uh, it's starting to be named spiritual intelligence by some people in the in that level of work, but I I don't know if it's if we're recognizing it quite yet. Um, because we're in this period of time where it's so, where anger is, seems to be, there's just this current of anger and fear that seems to be running through our, um, through our culture and our communities and the world for that matter. Um, and to, <clears throat> the response to that in my opinion, the only way to respond to that is with an attitude of love. And I, I think of that as not just kind of, it's got that, the emotional part of it too, but as a practice, love as a practice. What, if I'm gonna make choices about what I'm doing, am I gonna take the, 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 the path of whatever the opposite of that is, resistance or, um, not that resistance isn't, isn't part of it, but you know, am I gonna get all up in myself um, and probably respond to anger back with anger or some other kind of stronger physical force. Um, and so, and I, you know, I did, there, are, there are a few people in my life right now who, who are just saying that kind of over and over again. We have a friend, Shoinka, who, she's just made that the center of, of what she um, is kind of promoting in the world. Um, and her circumstances are much different than mine. Uh, so to be able to, um, to hear that message from her gives a particular kind of power. Um, but it just seems to me that, that at this point in time, that that's, the, that's what I want to put at the center of how I'm making my decisions. And it was kind of funny, I was doing this little thing with, um, I teach interplay in Australia. I've been going there for a number of years. And I was doing a little bit of work with a guy who's in Australia, and he was leading me through a process that he uses as a business consultant with, um, with folks. And long story short, at the end of the process, we were kind of narrowing down kind of what was at the center, what I saw as the center of interplay, and there was love, you know, right in the middle. And I'm not, an, I'm, I do not, and Cynthia can attest to this, I do not kind of live out of my emotions. Um, if, like, if I, I, as I often say, if I believed in sh chakras, which I don't really, but you know, I work up in my life. I look work up pretty high, and so it's not. But there's that word, you know, right at the center of what I think we're doing, which I think is, is really, really the thing. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's not just a motivator. It's a, it's a force, you know, that I think is really at in the middle of. Um, how I want to make choices in the world in a broad way, and I think it's right at the center of how we work in interplay, that our job is to, is to love up people <laughs> and to g give them ways to love up each other. That's mm -hmm. probably the stronger thing that we do, is we give them opportunities to love each other, um, to take care of 
each other rather than us taking care of them. So. Mm -hmm.